our final section of the hematology section is the bleeding disorders, ITP, which is now called immune thrombocytopenic purpura, von Willebrand's disease, the hemophilias and factor 11 deficiencies, DIC, thrombophilia, which is sometimes called hypercoagulable states, and heparin-induced thrombocytopenia, which is a new, modern, and popular thing to know about. The first step in the evaluation of any bleeding disorder is to determine if the bleeding is platelet-related or clotting factor-related. Do not start with the blood test. If you start with the blood test, you're going to get the answers wrong. There's five separate things that cause a high PTT with a normal PT. You could clot, you could have platelet bleeding, factor bleeding, no bleeding, or occasional bleeding under conditions of stress. But you can't answer it by the blood tests. First, you say platelet bleeding is superficial. Superficial. Factor bleeding is deep. Platelet bleeding is superficial. Nasal, gingiva, epistaxis, gingiva, petechia, purpura, gums, vaginal bleeding. And remember, petechia is small, purpura is big, but they're superficial bleeding. Factor bleeding is deep into the joints and the muscles, the joints and the muscles. Delayed hemarthrosis in a male child, hemophilia. Delayed hemarthrosis in a male child, hemophilia. Now, bleeding into the brain or the GI symptoms can be either from platelets or clotting factor. So brain or GI system can be either one. Start with the type of bleeding. Immune or idiopathic thrombocytopenic purple, ITP. Look for isolated thrombocytopenia. In other words, it's not a pancytopenia, just the platelets alone are low. With a normal hematocrit, normal white cell count, and a normal size spleen by itself. That's enough information to say it's ITP. We have a 23-year-old woman who comes to the emergency department. She's got increased menstrual bleeding gum bleeding, and when she brushes her teeth and petechiae, platelets are really low, what do you want to do next? The answer is steroids. You see, the bone marrow can show you increased megakaryocytes. Intravenous immunoglobulins are a very fast way to raise the platelet count, but not necessary because this type of bleeding is relatively minor. A little gum bleeding when she brushes her teeth, a little petechiae, is this little skin and mouth. She's not dying. Antiplatelet antibodies are simply not as important as prednisone. Prednisone is more important than checking for the megakaryocytes or antiplatelet antibodies. And a platelet transfusion is rarely done ever, even when the bleeding is severe, simply because platelets are consumed right away. So don't give platelets. Raise the platelet count by stopping the destruction. Stop the destruction first. In this case, you're going to see this as minor bleeding. Yes, it's minor because it's not in the bowel and the brain. Minor bleeding in a person who's hemodynamically stable, and it's clear, it's clear. So raise the platelet count with steroids. ITP is a diagnosis of exclusion. The occasional tests that are sometimes used are just simply to exclude production problems. Antiplatelet antibodies are nearly useless. They lack specificity, they're extremely limited benefit, an ultrasound or CT scan to make sure there's no hypersplenism is sometimes useful if you're not sure, gee, is this hypersplenism or is this ITP? And if you're not certain that there's a production problem, we do a bone marrow to make sure the megakaryocytes are high. In other words, ITP is a destruction problem, not a production problem. So once it's clear that it's ITP, start treatment. Don't wait for these other tests. The management of ITP is largely based on being sure which therapy is right based on the platelet count. If there's no bleeding and your platelet count is above 30,000, 40,000, 50,000, there's no point in doing anything. Don't do anything for that. Because a person who's got above 30 or 40,000 platelets just doesn't need 70,000. Now, it would be different if somebody was going to go for surgery. If you're going to get surgery, you're going to get your gallbladder taken out, you're going to have a coronary bypass, then we would like to have something closer to 60 and 70,000 platelets. But if you're not bleeding and you feel okay, 30,000 is just fine. Now your questions are not going to be equivocal. They're not going to say it's 30,000 and one platelets or 32,000. It's going to be 92 or 22. It's going to be much more clear. Now, if there's mild bleeding, the platelet counts under 30,000, the first thing is some glucocorticoids to stop the destruction. 
severe bleeding, and let's be very clear, you're a student who needs to know precisely what it means to say severe, unequivocal, means major bowel, not a little black positive brown stool, but melena, melena, major bowel bleeding, or anything in the brain, or if your platelet count's under 10,000, intravenous immunoglobulin, and sometimes we use Rogam, anti ro as immunoglobulins to bring up the platelet count. The short answer is the fastest way to bring up the platelet count is to use IVIG or sometimes Rogam. The problem with Rogam is that if you're RH positive, is that your Rogam can be useful, can be uh, difficult to use. So IVIG. Recurrent episodes or people who are steroid dependent, in other words, you, you stop the steroids and uh, it recurs, you start the steroids, it gets better, you stop the steroids and it recurs, you gotta get the spleen out. The splenectomy will solve about 70% of it. Now for those people who continue to recur, then you should use Romiplostim or Altrombobag for recurrences after splenectomy. Now, Altrombobag and Romiplostim are drugs that stimulate platelet growth. They are thrombopoietin. Thrombopoietins. Now, they can also be used if splenectomy or steroids is not effective. And you can also use these last-ditch drugs control the lymphocytes that make the immunoglobulins, right? Tuximab, azathioprine, cyclosporin, mycophenolate. And as such, this starts to become like when we were talking about intra, uh, the IgGs against red cells. Well, what happens when you're trying to control lymphocytes? These are the other drugs you use to control lymphocytes. Don't forget to vaccinate before you do the splenectomy. Before that splenectomy, make sure you vaccinate for Neisseria, Haemophilus, and Pneumococcus. Next disorder is von Willebrand's disease. Now, von Willebrand's disease is the most common inherited bleeding disorder. Von Willebrand's factor is decreased in either level or function. It could be a decreased amount or they just don't work. It's an autosomal dominant disorder, and this is a very highly tested subject. This is a person who's got platelet type of bleeding with a normal platelet count. Platelet type bleeding. Remember how I said it's really important to decide the type of bleeding before you do any blood tests? This is why. Because if you see the blood tests, you're going to see a person who gets not just markedly worse after aspirin, but that PTT is elevated. You'll be like, oh, wow, this must be hemophilia. No, because the wrong type of bleeding. The wrong type of bleeding for hemophilia. Hemophilia is factor bleeding, deep muscles and joints and muscles and joints and muscles and joints. This is a platelet type of bleeding with a normal platelet count. A platelet type of bleeding with a normal platelet count von Willebrand's disease. The diagnostic tests are, occasionally we use a bleeding time, not too much, a little barbaric. You cut them and see how long it takes them to stop bleeding. More important, if all of these are in the answer, von Willebrand's factor level also known as factor 8 antigen is decreased, or ristocetin cofactor looks at the function. In other words, von Willebrand's disease can be either from a decreased amount or decreased function, decreased amount or decreased function. If I want to look at the amount, I do the antigen level. If I want to look at the function, I do ristocetin testing. And von Willebrand's disease can be from either one of these. Now, because there's a decreased level or decreased functioning of von Willebrand's factor, that's why the PTT can go up. Because remember, factor eight antigen, which is the von Willebrand's factor, and factor eight coagulant, which is the hemophilia factor, travel bound to each other. And when you're deficient or dysfunctional in von Willebrand's factor, it destabilizes the factor eight coagulant. And that's why the PTT can go up in half the cases. The best initial therapy is unquestionably DDAVP, desmopressin, cause the release of subendothelial stores of von Willebrand factor. That's where it lives, it's where it hangs out. You get in there and you tickle those endothelial cells to cause a release, and it gets more stickiness out of your platelets. And if it doesn't work, if there's no response, you use factor eight replacement or von Willebrand factor concentrates. You actually just replace the substance itself. Remember the same way that factor eight antigen, von Willebrand factor, factor eight coagulant, hemophilia factor are bound stored to each other. That's the same reason you can use desmopressin for von Willebrand's and for hemophilia. You can replace factor eight for von Willebrand's and hemophilia.
Speaking of hemophilia, let's look for delayed bleeding into a joint in a male child. It's X-linked recessive. That means women carry it, but men express it. Delayed bleeding in a male child because the primary hemostatic plug is with platelets. So the child gets a little injury and then the platelet plug forms, but then you don't get fiber to stabilize it. The PT is normal. The PTT is prolonged. Now the most accurate test, remember delayed bleeding in a male child at the beginning, the most accurate test is the specific assay factor of assays for factor eight and factor nine. But remember, you start with a mixing study. Because it's a deficiency, the mixing study will correct it to normal. Mixing studies correct to normal. Mixing studies correct to normal. Mixing studies correct to normal. When you're deficient, if you have an inhibitor, it won't correct to normal. But deficiencies correct and inhibitors don't. And mild cases are treated with desmopressin, which causes a release of subendothelial stores of factor eight and von Willebrand's factor and make those platelets sticky. Severe bleeding needs to have the factor replaced. In factor 11 deficiency, most of the time, there's no increase in bleeding. There isn't. They live quite normally, except under conditions of trauma or surgery. Then there's increased bleeding. You look for a person with a normal PT and prolonged PTT. Well, haven't we seen that before? That's the same numbers in hemophilia A and B. That's the same normal PT, prolonged A PTT that you'd see in von Willebrand's disease. Now you know why to start with what's the type of bleeding. A mixing study will correct it to normal because remember, mixing studies will correct the PTT down to normal if it's deficiency. Mixing studies take advantage of the fact that you have to be deficient, missing 70 to 80% of the clotting factor. You have to be missing almost all of it before your PTT even begins to go up. In other words, if you're missing 10 or 20% of the clotting factor, your PTT goes nowhere. You have to be down to 10 or 20, 30% level for sure, missing 70 or 80%. That means if I mix you up with normal plasma, even if you're 100% deficient, it means that you'll come to 50% level if I mix you up 50-50. If you have zero level, if I mix you up 50-50, and it will correct that PTT to normal. You must understand the mixing study. You must. The treatment is to use fresh frozen plasma to stop the bleeding if there's bleeding. If there's no bleeding, the answer is no therapy necessary. Factor 11 deficiency, no bleeding most of the time, bleeding under conditions of trauma and stress, mixing study is first, specific factor level later on, FFP only if there's bleeding. DIC doesn't occur in otherwise healthy people. You don't get DIC just walking down the street doing nothing. It just doesn't. It just doesn't. You've got to have a person who's septic and burns or burnt septic or having an amniotic fluid embolus or abruptio placenta or being bitten by a pregnant snake with abruptio placenta or trauma with tissue factor release and cancer. You've got to have something major. And the bleeding is related to both clotting factor deficiency as well as thrombocytopenia because everything's been consumed. It's a consumptive coagulopathy in very overwhelmingly ill people. The diagnostic test for DIC is you're going to see an elevation of both the PT and PTT. Now, there's not that many things that elevate both the PT and PTT. There's DIC, vitamin K, liver disease. Because vitamin K deficiency inhibits factors, ready? 2, 7, 9, and 10. 2, 7, 9, and 10. So it elevates both the PT and the PTT. But in vitamin K deficiency, the platelet count will be normal. And in DIC, the platelet count is low because you've consumed all the platelets. Now, in DIC, you've also consumed all the clotting factors and chopped it up. Plasmin chops it up into D-dimers and fibrin split products. These are sometimes known as fibrin degradation products. Fibrinogen level is decreased because it's been consumed. Fibrinogen and fibrin degradation products is converted into D-dimers and fibrin split products. And liver disease... It can elevate the PT, PTT too, but you do not have the low platelet count most of the time, and you don't get the elevated D-dimer and fibrin split products.
The DIC is treated based on its severity. If you're bleeding and the platelet count is under 50,000, remember, bleeding and under 50,000, replace the platelets. If you're bleeding and you have an elevated PT, PTT, you use fresh frozen plasma. Now, one of the problems is that people get taught sometimes that since it's a consumptive coagulopathy, you're clotting at some level. But heparin has no benefit in these patients. Don't give heparin to DIC. And even though you might have some old fact from the step one USMLE part of your brain about, hey, isn't there clotting somewhere? No, not when they present. Because people with DIC present once all the clotting factors have been used up. They present when they're bleeding. So don't give heparin to people who are bleeding. Cryoprecipitate may be effective to replace fibrinogen if FFP doesn't control the bleeding. Cryoprecipitate is never first in anybody. Cryoprecipitate is used to replace fibrinogen in people having major consumptive coagulopathy. Hypercoagulable states and thrombophilia are the most common cause of factor V Leiden mutation. But I want to be clear about this. People who clot on airplanes, they're not normal. Most people who clot on airplanes have an underlying factor V Leiden mutation. People who clot with oral contraceptives, they generally have an underlying coagulopathy. They have a hypercoagulable state. So a lady who has a clot with the use of oral contraceptives most likely has a factor V Leiden mutation underlying it. Now, why is it that if somebody comes in with an unprovoked DVT or PE, we still don't have to test for these? Why aren't we testing for protein C and protein S antithrombin or factor V Leiden mutation during the acute episode? There's a very distinct reason. The very distinct reason that we're not testing for those hypercoagulable states is that they don't change the intensity of anticoagulation. It's hard for people to believe, but even if you had factor V Leiden mutation, even if you had protein C and protein S deficiency, even if you had antithrombin deficiency, it doesn't change the fact that you go to an INR of two to three for six months. It doesn't change the duration of therapy on the first clot. The only one that makes a difference with the first clot is antiphospholipid syndromes. The others don't make a difference on the first clot, so there's no reason to test for them. Factor V mutation is a resistance to protein C. Protein C inhibits the clotting cascade by inhibiting factor V. But if the factor V is mutated, it ignores protein C. So it's like being protein C deficient. Remember, it may be the most common, but it doesn't change the intensity of anticoagulation nor the duration of six months. Heparin-induced thrombocytopenia hit is more common with unfractionated heparin, but it can still occur with any form or any amount of heparin. It's less common, but still can occur with low molecular weight. It can present as a form of drop of platelets five or 10 days after the start of heparin, four, five, six days, and it has to drop the platelet count by at least 30%, but it usually does much more than that. And remember, HIT is a clotting disorder. You get venous and arterial thrombosis, with venous thrombosis being more common. HIT is not a bleeding disorder. It rarely leads to bleeding. The platelets precipitate out. They cause clotting. So you've got to stop the heparin. And remember, if the option says switch from IV unfractionated to low molecular weight heparin, it is wrong. You can't just switch to low molecular weight. It's like penicillin allergy. If you're allergic to one form of penicillin, you can't switch to another form of penicillin. You gotta get out of the penicillins. Now, there are diagnostic tests, but we rarely have them in time. But they are the answer to the question, which of the following confirms HIT? And HIT's confirmed with an ELISA for platelet factor 4 antibodies. Platelet factor 4 antibody is a platelet factor antibody that's made against both heparin and platelets. It's a heparin-dependent antiplatelet antibody. It's a heparin-dependent antiplatelet antibody. Or serotonin release assay. Now, these may be the most accurate tests, but you have to stop the heparin, and switch the therapy to argatriban, hiridin, arbatriban, lipiridin, bivalarudin. You have to stop the heparin and switch the therapy 
before these tests come back. Stop the heparin, all heparins. Don't switch to low molecular weight heparin. And although platelet factor four antibodies and serotonin release are the most accurate, don't wait for them to stop heparin and switch the medication. So after you stop the heparin containing products, you realize you can't just switch the unfractionated to low molecular weight heparin. So you use direct thrombin inhibitors, argatrin, apiridin, bivalirudin, argatrin, hiridin, bivalirudin. You see, after you use the direct thrombin inhibitor, then you start the use of warfarin. And then you treat to an INR of two to three. But remember, HIT makes clots. And if you transfuse platelets, you're gonna make more clots. So do not transfuse platelets into those with HIT, you're gonna make more clots. The antiphospholipid syndromes are indispensably important for you to know about. There's two types, the lupus anticoagulant and the anticardiolipid antibody. They both cause thrombosis, and anticardiolipid antibodies cause multiple spontaneous abortions. You should go looking for them when there's one second trimester spontaneous abortion or two first trimester spontaneous abortions. And the antiphospholipid syndromes are specifically cause a thrombophilia clotting with an abnormally increased PTT. Now these disorders are very highly tested and you have to understand that these, the name lupus anticoagulant is misleading. It's called an anticoagulant simply because it raised the PTT, but it does not make you bleed. The best initial test is a mixing study and that is because the PTT is elevated and you want to see if this is a deficiency or not. Because it's an antibody inhibitor, you mix it up, you mix it up, and the inhibitor makes it so the PTT remains elevated after the mix, a circulating inhibitor. Deficiencies correct and inhibitors don't correct. So you have to do a specific test for lupus anticoagulant, which is the Russell Viper Venom test. That's the specific test for the lupus anticoagulant. Now, the management of these is different in the sense that this is the only one worthwhile testing for with the acute clot. Why? Because it's the only one that changes anything. You treat with heparin and warfarin as you would for any other DVT, but antiphospholipid syndromes may get lifelong anticoagulation with the first clot. That's why when the question says, which of the following is the most important to test for, antiphospholipids is the answer. Now your question may use the word antiphospholipid, it may use the word lupus anticoagulant or anticardiolipin, but we're working backwards from the point of therapy. Why test for it? Will I do anything different? And in this case, you might. You might use lifelong anticoagulation. Now, some people might say, gee, I have a thrombophilia. Shouldn't I be on warfarin forever for all of them? And you forget that warfarin causes bleeding. So if I told you that you would have a 1% chance a year of having major bleeding, bowel and brain, bowel and brain, every year, you have to say, well, what am I getting for that long extra risk of bleeding? You're 30 years old. You're 25 years old. You're clotted. By the time you're 50, one out of four of you would bleed in your brain? Oh, do I really need this? So the answer is, in most cases, no. Factor V Leiden may be the most common cause of thrombophilia, but it doesn't change therapy. The only one that changes therapy, antiphospholipids. It will not correct on mixing studies. You have to do a specific test of lupus anticoagulant cause the Russell Viper venom. You give heparin and warfarin as you would for any other cause of clot. Just extend the length of therapy.